In this video, we are going to be talking about the Mount of Venus and how it rules everything from your love life, how attractive you're perceived in this world, and also how much luxury you're going to attain in this life. I'll show you guys not only how to measure how much of this stuff you'll get in your life, but I'll also teach you guys how to remove the blockages and the things that are a hindrance getting in the way of this. All of this is coming up. Hey guys, welcome back to Chari Palmistry, where we give you the tools to help you navigate your life. My name is Sulab Jain, and in this video, we're going to be talking about the Mount of Venus. Now, in order to understand the Mount of Venus, we should probably talk about what Venus represents. You see, if you read the olden day palmistry textbooks, they'll tell you that Venus represents love, beauty, and basically anything desirable in life. This definition is far too simplistic. I want you guys to really grasp the spiritual meaning of what Venus represents. So if you get the concept, then the definition will make a lot more sense. You see, Venus represents any object that the senses pick up. So anything that you can touch, taste, smell, hear, or feel is a Venus object. So if you see a beautiful woman, then she is Venus. If you taste nice food, then that food is Venus. If you hear a nice song, then that song is Venus too. And if you look at Venus through this lens, then it's really anything, really it's any input that comes into your awareness or into your consciousness. Your senses go out into the world and they try and figure out what's happening. They pick up on Venus. A beautiful woman is a strong Venus. A not-so-beautiful woman is a weak Venus, let's say. Good food is strong Venus. Bad-tasting food is bad Venus. Think of uh, the concept of Venus through that lens. Now, if you do sort of tunnel down into what that definition is, then a lot of old spiritual philosophy will start to make sense. Because if you read the olden day yoga books or meditation books, they talk about a thing or a concept known as a sense object. What they mean by that is any object that the senses perceive and pick up, that object becomes a hindrance on your spiritual path. Or more correctly, the attachment to that object becomes a hindrance to your spiritual path. What those old philosophers were talking about was actually Venus, or more correctly, the attachment to Venus. If you've ever listened to a song that gets stuck in your head and you just can't get it out, that autoplay or that auto loop of that song in your mind is detracting you from your spiritual progress. It's stopping you connecting to like that higher source power that you should be connecting to. That's what they're talking about. If you understand Venus through this lens, then you'll understand that it's really a double-edged sword. It can give you anything and everything that's desirable in life. However, if you get attached to those desirable things, then they can detract you from your spiritual progress. I want you guys to think of Venus through this lens. So in order to understand that aspect of Venus, let's talk about where the Mount of Venus is located on the hands. So the area for Venus is at the base of the palm, underneath the thumb. And its location on the hand over here is a very important placement too, because you need to understand the Venus mount relative to the other mounts around it. And they are Mars, Rahu, and Ketu. You see, Mars is a planet for discipline and willpower, and it's placed right on top of Venus meaning that its energy is actually the very beginning of Venus. So think of it this way. Let's say you want to buy a nice car, and you're in love with the design of it, and you think it's beautiful. You've fallen in love with the Venus element of that car. So once you fall in love with the car, you then need to work hard to earn the money in order to buy that vehicle. So Mars is the discipline needed to earn the money to attain that Venus object. So think of Mars as that inner quality that obtains the external Venus. And this is why people say that Mars and Venus are opposites, or that one is masculine and the other is feminine. But they're actually opposites that end up attracting each other. Mars leads to Venus. So to see a person with a good amount of willpower, patience, and discipline, you want to be looking for a Mars line that comes into the Mount of Venus. 
Now, this is known as a line for vitality and willpower. Usually, people who have this line have a strong Mars. And over time, they start to obtain their heart's desires through sheer discipline and tenacity. And by the way, monks have a very long Mars line too. But that's because their desire is spiritual growth, not like a material object. So you still need a Mars-based discipline for that, but the outcome is different. So that's the first element of Venus. It starts with Mars. The next element then is the Rahu Mount. And you can follow this sequence if you follow the path of the lifeline around the Mount of Venus. It starts with Mars, goes through Rahu, and ends on Ketu. So Rahu represents obsession and craving. And Venus is the object that you get obsessed about and crave. So remember a moment ago when I was talking about the spiritual philosophy books saying that sense objects lead to a detraction on the spiritual path or to spiritual ruin? Well, they're talking about the Rahu obsession with Venus. So imagine you fall in love with that car that we were talking about, but you lack the discipline to earn the money to buy that car. Well, all you're going to do in that case is daydream about that car or that Venus object. And then your daydreaming will become an obsession, and over time your obsession will create more suffering for you than the joy of actually owning that car in the first place. This is a classic addict's trap. You experience an illusion, a taste of joy of driving a nice car, then before you know it, you're trapped in your fantasy and you can't get out. And by the way, in this example, you can substitute the word car out for like a pretty girl, nice clothes, an awesome song, even a nice house. The object that your senses pick up isn't as important as what's happening in your mind as your brain perceives these Venus objects. Now, the Rahu lines run through the Venus mount, and they cut through the lifeline. And every time this happens, you will go through a period of suffering in your life. And it's usually because you desire something, but you aren't able to obtain it and Rahu has manipulated it out of your life. So in a general sense, to see how much suffering your person will go through in their life, look at the number of Rahu lines that they have, and how thick or deep those lines cut through the hands. For example, if they have Rahu lines at the top half of their lifeline, then the first half of their life is full of suffering, and the second half of their life is much easier. Otherwise, if you see these horizontal lines coming across the Mount of Venus, but not actually cutting through the lifeline, then this is a period of their life where the person desires something, but that desire does not cause suffering. It's like a false alarm being hit in their life at the age that this line comes close to their lifeline. And then there's Ketu. This planet is the opposite of Rahu in the sense that Mars is the opposite of Venus, but that they're actually working and that they're closely linked to each other. If Rahu is the attachment to something in this world, then Ketu is a detachment from the world itself. You see, Ketu is your past life karma and your path towards enlightenment. So if Rahu binds your karma in this life through attachment and ignorance, then Rahu wants to release that karma. And this is what the vertical lines on the Venus Mount represent. It's your capacity to transcend your senses towards enlightenment. And the most important of these lines is the one that comes up at the corner of the hand. This is the hand for your mother, the person who brought you into the world to help you release your karma. But understand that she was, once upon a time, someone else's Venus. And as a result of that, now you're born. So if you can stomach the thought of your mother being someone else's Venus without wanting to vomit, then you really understand what Venus represents. It's birth as well as beauty. So that's a general lay of the land in terms of what Venus represents. Let's have a look at a few examples to see if someone has a strong Venus or if someone has a weak Venus. Now the first thing to have a look at is the very side of the hand here. Is this part of the hand concave, meaning does it curve inwards? And if it does, that's generally considered a weak Venus. On the other hand, if this part of the hand bulges outwards and it's convex in shape, then that's considered a strong Venus. That's one textbook definition. Here's another one, though. I want you to have a look on this part of the hand to see if it's just plain flat or if it's fleshy. 
If this part of the hand is plain flat, then this is someone who doesn't believe in their own beauty. And this hand on the screen right now is the hand of a 60-year-old woman, actually one of the most remarkable women I've ever met in my life. This is the hand of Robbie Canna. She's an Australian woman who won Miss World at the age of 60. She beat out women who were in their 20s to win that title a few years ago. Now, the reason she got into like beauty pageants is when she was younger, her son told her that she was so beautiful and that she should enter beauty pageants. But she didn't believe it. Right? She didn't have that inner confidence for herself. However, as her son got older, he tragically passed away. And as a way of honoring her, honoring her son's memory, she entered Miss World. Well, actually, she entered like Miss Sydney and then became Miss Sydney, then became Miss New South Wales, Miss Australia. Then before she knew it, she became Miss World. So you can have a flat mount of Venus over here, but still be objectively a very beautiful person, but you may not actually know that you're a beautiful person. So that's one aspect of Venus, if it's flat. If this mount of Venus is fleshy, meaning if it kind of bulges out on top of the hand here, then that represents a strong Venus, meaning this is someone who's going to attain a lot of luxury and a lot of uh, beauty in their life. Now, this hand on the screen right now is a hand of a man who's 50 years old, and he started a company with a close friend of his about 20 years ago. And if you look at this vertical line that comes up here, this happens at close to the age of 50. And what happened at this age for this man was he actually IPO'd his company at a valuation of $10 billion. But just after that point, you're going to notice all these Dahu lines cutting through it. Meaning before that point, this man had little to no suffering in his life. Then he had all this tremendous success, and now he's able to afford all this beauty in his life. Afterwards, all that suffering is going to come back to him. So that's a few examples of Venus and how it can help you, how it can bring good stuff into your life, and even how to transcend it. What I want to talk about now is how to remove some of the negative aspects of Venus and how to use it and build it into your life. And I'll start by showing you this picture over here. This is the hands of actually a palmistry student of mine from a number of years ago. What you're going to notice is he has a black dot on the Mount of Venus. Now, generally speaking, black dots are considered malefic energy. They're actually a little bit worse than the horizontal lines that run through here. The horizontal lines are a sign of ignorance or being captivated by beauty and becoming attached to it, the black dots are more deep-rooted karmic problems going on. Now, this person over here is very spiritual, has been doing a lot of meditation work, and after a period of about two years, you'll notice that that black dot has actually disappeared. And so these malefic or benefic indications on the Mount of Venus, they can actually come and go depending on how much hard work you do on yourself. And the most important uh, area to improve your Venus, or if I were to give you one practice to do to strengthen your Venus, it would be fasting. You see, fasting is a form of discipline. So automatically, it's already connected into Mars itself or Mars's energy. But by abstaining from food, you're abstaining from a sense object, right? Food is something you taste, and therefore it's Venus-based. So you can strengthen your Mars whilst deliberately weakening your Venus, and that paradoxically strengthens your Venus. I want to leave you guys with that thought. Venus is your sense objects, and you can strengthen it or weaken it as you choose. You can use it to improve your life, or you can use it to increase your suffering. If you guys have any questions on this, put them in the comment section below, and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.